What is going on, Badger fans? We be recruiting like blue bloods. We got John Garcia Jr. on the show. We're going to talk about C.J. Williams, another quarterback coming in, and get his perspective on, from a national standpoint, how unique is what Wisconsin is doing here. So we're going to get that perspective next on Lockdown Badgers with John Garcia Jr. Let's go. You are Locked On Badgers, your daily podcast on the Wisconsin Badgers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, Badger fans? Welcome to another episode of Locked On Badgers. I'm your host, Ryan Herrings. As always, really, really do appreciate everybody tuning in. Today's show is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. And as promised, John Garcia Jr., Locked On's recruiting insider, joining us. John, this is in real life, right? Like we've we've been joking about it. I feel like a blue blood. Is this what when you talk to Ohio State people, Auburn people, every every week they're getting four star guys? Is this what this is like? Yeah, it, it's it's becoming a, a thing to where you you're going to bring in like all conference Cincinnati players and not talk about them. I mean, that's that's where we're at at this point with Wisconsin. And it's funny because you joked last time we were on as we were wrapping up. Hey, next time I talk to you, there'll be another quarterback. And we're like, yeah, that's probably not going to happen. They have plenty. And then here we are. Braden Locke is, is on board. So now this is this is interesting. I, I think just in general, all of this attention uh, up in Madison, I think, says so much about everybody involved. And these portal kids that they're recruiting that weren't Wisconsin targets in high school get up to Madison. And they're like, oh, this this is great. <laughs> so it's that combination of increased uh, coaching star power, obviously bring in Phil Longo, star offensive coordinator that everybody is going to give the benefit of the doubt to. And then the visits, the academics, the campus, all of that is kind of wrapping it up simultaneously for a lot of these portal guys. Just fascinating. It's it's one of these, it's like a full scale attack that's just perfectly in line right now uh, from one group to the next. And yeah, it's, it's netting a a whole lot of new players. Well, and let's talk about that full scale attack, getting guys to Madison players that weren't original targets, CJ Williams, CJ Williams, the USC transfer six to 200 pounds had offers from everybody in high school. This is the highest ranked receiver Wisconsin has landed in the recruiting era. Tell us, tell us a little bit. I mean, listen, it's kind of a low bar as well, if we're being (laughs) honest, but that still goes back a while now. Of course. Um, tell us a how surprised you were that he ended up in Madison and B. What are we potentially getting with his game here? Yeah, I was surprised. There's there's no doubt. Um, look on the front end, uh, you know, CJ's a guy who coming out of modern day, I mean, was was the number one uh, high school in the country, literally on the football field for probably his entire career uh there with the monarchs. Um, and and he caught passes from a lot of scholarship guys going back to to Bryce Young and, and now Elijah Brown uh, the last couple of years, this was one of the more polished, productive, high floor wide receivers that we scouted over the last several years. You mentioned the size, 6'2", 200 pounds, incredible ball skills on top of that. There was a famous SI photo, I think it made a magazine at one point, where he's one-handing that thing in a game against St. John Bosco, which is, you know, the other elite school out that way uh so so he's got the the total package and naturally his recruitment was incredibly hectic out of high school long time notre dame verbal commitment so he definitely was on board with coming to the midwest to, to play his college football for a very long time before usc flipped him there really at the last minute at the 11th hour he flips over to to the local usc trojans which is totally understandable from a wide receiver perspective and then Lincoln Riley comes in and a million receivers join uh, up at USC and, and they they kind of do their own thing. So what, a, what an advantageous situation for anybody courting C.J. Williams to to be in. But, yeah, if I would have told you or you would have told me he ends up at Wisconsin, the moment you know he hit the portal, I would have been like, no way. There's just going to be too many, one, closer to home options that are going to be very – uh, receiver friendly again just look at the quarterbacks in the Pac-12 right now with the guys who came back and the guys who have been added in the last six months I mean it's unbelievable with the quarterback talent in, in the Pac-12 
So you would assume he stays out in that footprint. And then if he didn't, you're like, hey, does Notre Dame circle back on him? How does it look with other schools, you know, uh, east of the Mississippi? And and lo and behold, he ends up at Wisconsin. So, again, players are taking in these visits and changing that perception with Wisconsin. And I think for him, you, you think of Phil Longo, you think of that offense at North Carolina. It's one of those where everybody ate. Uh, you could be the dynamic slot receiver like a Josh Downs and certainly get a, a ton of, of workload, but those outside receivers had a lot of targets as well. And with the type of downfield ability that is within that offense, you maximize those opportunities. And for a guy like C.J. Williams, who has that polish, which is maybe outside of Downs not congruent with a lot of those receivers that developed at North Carolina – it, you have the opportunity to hit the ground running. So I think it hits a little bit differently when you know the ball is going to be in the air and you know this offense now with, with Tanner Mordecai, who, who now brings a whole level of credibility to pass catching targets, which is what we talked about on the last show. Now there's a comfort level of, hey, not only am I going to go to a program that's going to play great competition and keep me in the spotlight, just like I was at USC, but now the coordinator is going to air it out and the quarterback has been there and done that simultaneously. That's just not a package that a lot of schools could offer at this moment relative to the 23 season, but obviously Wisconsin is one of them. That's a great point because it really feels like Domo's just ticking over, right? Luke Fickle leads to Phil Longo, which leads to Mordecai, which leads to C.J. Williams, which is going to lead to a national title next year, as we've talked about. <laughs> there you go. So what are the, I, Whatever the odds are, make the play now. <laughs> listen, they're getting better, right? We missed our window, I think. Um I want to go here. You mentioned a little bit the size, the polish. Where specifically maybe does he win on the football field? Because he's not a burner in the traditional sense of a, a deep threat receiver. That's why the polish is so important. He can stack a defensive back with his movement skills and his intellect as much as he can with the physical ability. And he's not slow by any means, but he's a developmental route runner who's going to win at the top of the route. Every stem off the line is going to look the same. Every move at the top of the route is going to look the same. And that's where he's going to win from the leverage standpoint. Uh, and then obviously the size and wingspan and catch radius all comes together with those ball skills to present a larger margin for error for whoever's throwing him the rock uh, in practice and certainly uh, on Saturdays up at Camp Randall. So it's not it's not gaudy. It's not something that um, is going to make a ton of highlights. But when you put it all together, the size, the polish, the ball skills, the tracking ability, uh, he becomes a, a very impressive receiver. I mean, look at the NFL right now, Ryan. If we want to really zoom out on this thing, how many of the very best receivers in the league are the very fastest? It, there's not a lot of crossover in that regard, it's the polished ones. It's the Stephon Diggs, the Devontae Adams, the Nuke Hopkins, the guys who can run ridiculous routes that are the ones creating the most separation and eventually making the most production and impact at the highest level. And that's where CJ really kind of breads his butter. Yeah, two more quick on CJ here. What is what are what are maybe realistic, and this is kind of impossible to say, but realistic expectations for a guy coming in he's still young he hasn't played a lot coming into a new system um what are some expectations here that that maybe badger fans need to maybe either temper themselves a little bit or what should we be looking at here look i, I think this wide receiver room is getting pretty busy it, it's pretty stacked up right you, you've brought in several transfers a bunch of the guys from 22 are back correct me if i'm wrong uh not a lot of those guys have, have hit the portal conversely so it's a bit of a busy room to expect him to immediately be wide receiver one or, or whatever that that high end of the e extreme expectation may be. But I think realistically, you expect him to crack the rotation on, on, on the front hand and the front end of the season. But by a certain game, you know, by, by the time the weather starts to turn and, and the rivalry games start to crank up, I think you would expect him to start to really make an ascent towards wide receiver one doesn't mean he'll end up there at any point this year but you expect him to make those moves and become at least at a minimum to me a reliable option you know when you bring in a polished big body guy with ball skills to me that's that's third and six hey 
are you a guy on third and six who's going to make a play at the sticks in front of that linebacker, in front of those safeties, uh, absorb some contact along the way? And I think that's where you're going to see the impact of, of a C.J. Williams. It won't be as flashy. It'll be much more workmanlike, which is certainly, I'm assuming, favorable with uh, the Wisconsin fan base. Yeah, we're stoked for it, man. All right, coming up, we're going to keep John on the show. We're going to talk about another quarterback into the portal and why this he's also going to factor heavily into the competition. That's coming up next, but first, a word from our friends over at Bet Online, sponsors of the show. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there, from pro football to college bowl season to basketball and World Cup. It's all over there at Bet Online. If you love sports podcasts, they have that as well, live casino games. Always the fastest and easiest way to get your betting info. It's a place I go to. I talk about my futures all the time. I, I am going to have to go find some futures on Wisconsin to win the Big Ten at least and get in on that. It's going to be fun to do that. I also got the Niners, the Suns. Y'all know this. It's a great way to do it responsibly. Bet online. Grab your mobile device. Head over to the website today. Bet online where the game starts. Again, I want to thank everyone making Lockdown Badgers your first listen every day. Really do appreciate y'all. When you're done here, go check out Lockdown College Basketball. Everything you need to know about college basketball in one place, plus hear from big name experts, insiders, coaches, and players. Locked on college basketball available on YouTube and wherever you get podcasts. All right, we're going to bring John back on. A bunch more to talk about. Uh, John, as always, where can people find your incredible work? Yeah, real simple. We're talking ball at every level on, on Twitter, and, and the links will flow from there. So John Garcia underscore JR. Definitely come come check us out. We're on a lot of uh, Audible platforms uh, as well. So it's talking season uh, already with the, with the 22 season officially in the books. Uh, so come follow along. I love it. Uh, let's talk about Braden Locke now, right? So we brought another transfer quarterback, Mississippi State kid, four-star quarterback out of high school obviously makes sense why quarterbacks out of Mississippi State are probably transferring at this point there's a lot of upheaval sure. there unfortunately what can you tell us about right uh Braden's game and how surprising was it to see another transfer quarterback head to Madison for you well I'll start with the last part um I'm super surprised right you 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 were always going to overhaul this QB room and and the moment you bring in Phil Longo that process accelerates right you had LaCrue on board on signing day, and then Longo has already provided multiple um, quarterbacks in the portal, uh, and of course, uh, one in 24 verbally committed. So two transfers already before Locke, I thought was plenty, right? You, you got your high upside, long-term, multiple years of eligibility guy in Nick Evers, and you got your, your rental, for lack of a better phrase, in the experienced, more mature and productive Tanner Mordecai. So bringing in another player with what four years of eligibility left is is really fascinating to me and you talk about overhauling a room you have now overhauled it to the point where you start to wonder which of the portal guys maybe starts to look around at some point could be after the spring once these guys all see the field could be fall camp after the 23 season whatever that is but that's another indicator ryan and we've talked about this of a great room You've got to not only accumulate talent and high-level talent, stack it from an eligibility standpoint, and then absorb the upcoming change because it's just a, a room of fluidity when you're talking quarterbacks at an elite uh, college football program. So I, I think I was surprised because of the volume, just how many interesting and different quarterback types are, are on the way to Madison, Wisconsin. But in terms of Braden himself, look, this is – this was a huge get for Mike Leach, rest in peace, when when he got him because obviously we know the system there at Mississippi State. If you think Phil Longo is going to throw it, um, our, our boy Mike Leach was going to throw it even more uh, in that true air raid style. And Locke fit right into that. Three-year starter in the state of Texas, Rockwall High School, where they, are, they were throwing it every down at that level from the spread, RPO. I mean, just the foundation of the modern era of high school football was was – or excuse me, of college football, was high school football in the state of Texas. And Locke is kind of that quintessential kid. 11,000 yards in high school, 129 touchdowns, just extremely productive with that combination of quick trigger decision-making uh, from the quarterback position and then a, an actual quick, quick trigger on his right arm with that classic three-quarter delivery to get the football out in a hurry. Uh, so that's something that naturally made him a, a pretty – coveted commodity uh, coming out of the state of Texas. Um, and, and look, Phil Longo was in on him. You know, North Carolina was one of the schools in the mix. It, it seemed like Locke had a lot of options in SEC and ACC country 
where North Carolina became one of them. Um, so naturally that relationship is rekindled. And, and he, he said it like even after he was on board with the Bulldogs, Longo maintained that relationship. So that's something that when you, when you pair it again, like we said at the top of the show with, with what Madison is presenting as a city, as a campus, Luke Fickle on top of it and this developing quarterback room, it's still that attractive for, for a guy like Braden Locke, who uh, when he hit the portal, a lot of schools wanted to circle back on because he has so much eligibility remaining and all of that high school production against great competition to his name. So for Wisconsin to win this one, I think says a lot. A competitive kid who's ready to work. Um, again, he, he's he's the floor guy. I mean, if you're if you're looking at Locke versus Evers, which I think is the natural conversation, he's the high floor. Evers is the high ceiling candidate to look at beyond the, the Mordecai era, which theoretically begins uh, right now. Uh, and then you've got Cole LaCrue in there and then eventually Martyr in 2024. I mean, it's fascinating to look at. You expect attrition to come from one of those four names beyond Mordecai. Um, but but Locke is going to absolutely be a player in this race. I think even on the front end, because now if, if Mordecai is the guy we all think he is, the battle's for QB2. Mm. And it will be intense right out of the gate between all three of, of those other names that we mentioned. So Locke is going to make a play uh, in this quarterbacking race because the system fit is something he's already borderline mastered. And he has developed further under Mike Leach at Mississippi State behind Will Rogers, who is rewriting all the SEC passing record books. So in terms of production and style, um, in the pocket, especially Braden Locke really fits what Phil Longo wants to do. That's a fascinating point you just made. Um, and this is why we have John on the show, by the way, because he's far smarter than I am. Uh, bringing up the the number two battle, right? Because that's not mm -hmm. what we've talked about. We've talked about Mordecai. And then next year you have this, this colossal battle between multiple people. Like like he's mentioned, LaCruz is going to be in that battle as well. Super confident kid, as we both know. Oh, yeah. uh, but the, whoever gets the number two spot this year might also kind of set themselves up to springboard in the next year. And to your point, Locke might be better prepared to be that number two this season than Evers, who's more the developmental kid. 100%, right? And, and LaCruz just brings a, a, a variety of things to the table on his own. Uh, so that's going to be fascinating in and of itself. That's why I think you could potentially, if we're playing devil's advocate on the other side of this thing, we could probably see movement at the end of spring ball because if there is a true pecking order and that battle for number two is relatively clear uh, between those three players, that third guy, you know, is, is his people are going to say, Hey, do we, is it too early to, to think about making a move or, or how does that look? The difference is for the two portal guys beyond Mordecai, they've made that one time transfer. So, so it becomes a little bit more, difficult and or uphill to make a move like that so and you wouldn't expect it from a true freshman in a cold crew so it'll be fascinating to watch that number one battle and then the number two battle that is probably more intense and more wide open beyond it just to see how those dominoes fall or, or maybe it's unsettled after spring football and, and still very much wide open so it, it's going to be really interesting to see all of that come together under a brand new coaching staff at, at a program like Wisconsin. And I want to zoom out for a second. I mentioned this off the sh off air before we got started. As Wisconsin fans, we're, we're understandably incredibly excited for what Fickle, Longo are building here. From a national perspective, because you, you, you have kind of an unbiased look at this, right? You follow recruiting, you follow a lot of programs. Be real here. How impressive is what Phil Longo has done in five weeks? How unusual is it to bring in this level of talent or not? Oh, it's fascinating. It's it's on the higher end. We We have seen... We've seen a lot of portal usage, right, uh, and, and and schools relying on it to flip position rooms in, in short order, yes. But the volume, the volume of intriguing arms in the span of however long it's been is quite unprecedented. I, I know before we recorded, I said, I know a lot of teams that have brought in two portal guys in the same year, but three ahead of spring ball. I, I hadn't really seen at least – that was easy to access, right? In terms of three known commodities. I think you're talking Nick Evers, an Elite 11 finalist. You're talking Tanner Mordecai, obviously as well accomplished uh, and productive a quarterback as there is at multiple programs before Wisconsin. And now you're bringing in one of the more decorated Texans of all time from the, from the high school perspective, all in a very short few week span. 
So yeah, I can't recall something to that degree from a volume perspective uh, in the sport in this this very brief and early uh, transfer portal era. Uh, so I, I've, I've seen them bring in two two different types, the contrasting styles to try to create a competitive situation. Yes, we see that across the country. But when you get to three and then the crew is really four, it's it's really it really feels unprecedented, especially relative to the timing uh, of all of this. Uh, while there's so many schools looking for a quarterback in the process that haven't landed one and Wisconsin has landed three um, at this point. Um, and look, I was I was scrolling some tweets earlier and Phil Longo tweeted that his QB room is complete now. So clearly this was the goal. Clearly this amount of quarterbacks and the level of talent simultaneously was the goal for Phil Longo. So you, you got to like the ambition on top of it. It's one thing to say, hey, let's bring in a couple of arms and make this thing interesting. But it, it's another to say, let's bring in a guy who everyone's going to envision as QB1. And then after that, let's bring in multiple players to compete that have a ton of eligibility remaining. I mean, that is fascinating, even just from an ambition standpoint, but you've got to have that. you got to have that boldness to go out and do things that we, we don't see uh, every single year. And that's something Wisconsin's done. That's awesome insight as always. All right, we're going to take a very quick break here. Coming up, we're going to talk about two key offensive players coming into the portal as well that we haven't had a chance to talk on, one of whom I think is an underrated potential star for Wisconsin. We're talking about that next on Lockdown Badgers, but first a break for our friends of the show. All right, we're going to bring John Garcia Jr. back on. Really do appreciate it. Again, everybody tuning in. If you're enjoying the show, the content, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. It really does help support the show. Uh, let's bring John Garcia Jr. back on. John, and again, we're not going to get to every portal transfer today. That's why we get you every week, my friend. Uh, right. But I do want to talk about two players specifically on the offensive line, starting with Jake Renfro. I think he is a completely undersold, underrated addition in this portal for Wisconsin. What, what's your feel on Renfro coming over? Well, look, I mean, according to him, this is a play to replace Joe Tipman. I mean, it's like a one-to-one -one thing. And I think, look, in recruiting, a lot of a lot of things are said and proclaimed and promised or whatever we want to call it, right? Uh, it's recruiting. You are trying to get a human being to dedicate his time to you. But when you bring up players and roles and it becomes a specific pitch – it does hit a little bit different. You know, it's not like Auburn saying you could be the next Bo Jackson and, and do whatever you want. That's great. I mean, and, and it'll work. But when you are going specific to the player, the role, the fit, the scheme, I think it hits different, especially in the portal, right? Because everything is accelerated with these guys. Uh, re recruiting pitches are few and far between. There was a kid who hit the portal yesterday from Georgia. I talked to his mentor and he said he's not officially in the portal, but I've gotten 20 schools. Mm -hmm. on record this kid hadn't even played yet right so this thing moves so fast both visually and, and behind the scenes with all of these players that it's got to be a unique pitch uh, and this one is so unique and and basically Renfro is saying the Tipman role is, is his for the taking um and I think that says a lot obviously there's continuity from from Luke Fickle on down here uh and I think that helps to create validity behind some of these these very bold pitches that Fickle and this coaching staff is, is making out here with, with portal prospects. So if if you're a versatile guy who can move to center and, and make all these things happen, you got to be great. And obviously there was an injury on top of all of this that, that slowed down maybe the name recognition here. But when Cincinnati was at its best, which is, of course, 21, Renfro was a huge centerpiece part of that run uh, that the Bearcats made. So that alone, to me, uh, creates a lot of intrigue. But again, the center role is 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 advantageous, especially when you're changing offensive style. Even if it's a tweak, I think it says a lot uh, that everybody's all in on this guy. So I'm with you. Uh, the ceiling is, is really unreachable at this point. You know, the expectations should be borderline sky high all conference here. Yeah, and you, you hit on something that I – we're going to finish up here with with uh, Renfro and the show, but you hit on something that I really liked about the Renfro edition, and that's the fact that he's experienced high level of success under Luke Fickle, right? And now you're bringing him into a locker room that, to some degree, with a new coach, I think Fickle's going to sell himself pretty darn well. But you're still there's still some uncertainty there. He can be inserted in that locker room, say, "I was in the playoffs. I I know what this guy can do. I'm here to get y'all to that level." Um, does that, am I just projecting stuff there or does that make sense on your end? That's huge. I mean, there's, 
again, we we're all giving Luke the benefit of the doubt immediately because we've we've been there and we've seen it because we're fans of the sport. That's not necessarily um, already there uh, when when you get to a new locker room. These these kids, a, a lot of them, aren't diehard college football fans. They're obviously a lot younger than, than you and I, so they don't have that that same just a peripheral vision, if you will, to absorb everything that has happened under under Fickle. Some of them might have had to hit Google or YouTube or, or look at the press release to figure out who, who their new coach is. So when you have these ambassadors that have lived it at a high level, it obviously it obviously hits different. You know, a locker room is is a fluid and tangible ball of emotion, intensity, perception that that can change on a whim. So Having some built-in buyers is never a bad thing, especially if you're putting them in at positions that already command respect. You know, your center is typically like your captain of the offensive line. He's getting guys in place and and, and ready for the attack as much as the quarterback is in, in a lot of offenses. So for that guy to potentially be an ambassador, I think it, it'll – be invaluable t- towards this transition, which is still something that has to happen physically, right? The numbers and the names are all changing right now ahead of spring ball. But once the pads come on and we're, we're go- getting after it from, from an intense practice standpoint, there's going to be another layer of who are, who are the guys, right? And that's true for the coaches, the players, people looking around as much as it is for us in the media that get to talk about it. Um, so if, if one of your alphas in theory – is one of your biggest buyers who's lived it already that is invaluable to sell to not only all the other players under transition that are that are entering this program but all the young players that that were inherited uh, by Luke Fickle and and obviously the the new recruits that are coming in uh, from the high school ranks right now Love it, man. As always, we run out of time before we run out of questions for John Garcia Jr. Uh, really do appreciate you jumping on. As always, we're going to tweet out. Uh, we do it every show, the link to his his content so you guys can follow along. John, until next week. I don't think there's any more quarterbacks, but we'll, we'll see. see. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> we will see. Uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in to Lockdown Badgers. Really do appreciate you all helping to build the community. Um, until we talk tomorrow on Wisconsin, and let's go.